hey, hey, um, Conscious Tribe, welcome to yet another episode. Today, I'm interviewing the charismatic, the transformational leader um, and visionary of Henley Business School Africa. Now, I need to tell you a little story. So I used to um, work with Henley Business School, but also managed to study there and do my postgraduate diploma in management practice. And boy, oh boy, did I learn a lot. I learned as above, so below. As within, so without. And I had to learn how to who, to dive very, very deep. I really felt that I had my life under control until I started studying my postgraduate diploma in management practice, especially reflecting upon my life and the self-awareness that I need to have to be a leader. And I'm continuously learning. And every day I realize how much I still need to learn. Um, without further ado, I, I just, um, I'm privilege to invite you John to be a guest here and I hope to be a guest many more times. Welcome. Oh, it's such a pleasure and congratulations by the way. I, I really admire you for throwing yourself into learning, doing so well and frankly taking it on exactly right by making it you know, personal, helping it change you and using that to make you more capable and knowing this is an endless journey. So respect. Thank you. Thank you for doing that and for trusting us. Thank you so much John. Um, okay, so I invited you to have a conversation today about um, transformational leadership. And, you know, I just want to, to bring the world in context for our listeners in terms of artificial intelligence has been a conversation that's been going around. But I don't think we really recognize the length and depth of this particular topic. And it just landed on top of us and it has spun out of control. The genie is out of the bottle. Now, what we are facing is the utopian um, evangelist that thinks everything is going to be honky-dory. It's going to be a perfect world now that we have AI and we're going to solve so many problems. And then there's the dystopian evangelists that are so negative that our world's going to end tomorrow. And then we have the protopians that can see both sides of, of, of you know, the environment and where it's going and knowing that yesterday was worse than the day after that. And tomorrow's going to be a little bit better and progress, progression is going to happen over an amount of time. And this is pretty much where we are finding ourselves within the dynamics of change. Now, if we look at um, what's happening currently, a big conversation is happening within the artificial intelligence environment. They initially created artificial intelligence to solve some of the world's biggest problems. They went in with good intent. Um, but these machines learn exp exponentially. It is actually believed that the machines are sentient, that they are far more conscious than human beings and can solve problems a billion times better. They, there is a prediction that they would be probably a billion percent more intelligent than human beings. That brings into question is um, what can we as human beings bring to the table? How can we dive deeper in becoming better leaders and looking at how we can work with machine, but also recognize that when these machines are being coded, the biases that goes into it, garbage in, garbage out. And if we are not self-aware, that speaks to the machine and the machine will process that information. And if we are on the wrong side of our biases, that would really show in a few years from now, if not in a few days from now. So, John, I just wanted to, to almost get a thermometer dipstick into how you are seeing this world that we are currently having in the past six months, and what is your take on it? Well, you know, I, I love that um, uh, dystopia, you know, and protopia and utopia thing. I, I hadn't heard of protopia before, actually, so thank you for that word. You know, and so, yeah, you're educating me. I really appreciate it. <laughs> um, the rest I did know about. But it's obviously a very simple concept, you know, in terms of, you know, the normal distribution of people on one end who are always pro, the other end who are always against, and then the ones in the middle who are grappling to make sense of it. So uh, the first thing I would say is that this dynamic between something innovating is going to destroy the world um, and... Uh, and may or may not, is, is an eternal dynamic. You know, you go back thousands of years and see people saying how much society is destroyed by the printing press or this or that, or whatever it is, and you can find many echoes of that. But I think we're facing something even more kind of potentially challenging right now with AI. Now, obviously, AI can do amazing things. It's already starting to be more useful in 
in um, diagnosing cancers or producing drugs that we need or uh, helping us write properly and simply on basic briefs or whatever. I mean, I use it all day, every day. You probably do as well. And you can see its utility. But it's, it is a different form of intelligence from us at the moment, um, as far as we understand it. And, of course, those plus sides, you know, if you can engineer a virus uh, that is going to help you or, or solution is going to help you cure from cancer, you can just as easily engineer something that would be mega dangerous, you know, you know, coronavirus on steroids. Or you mm -hmm. can... Uh, created for arms and weapons that, uh, that kill each other and kill people who get in the way. You know, only just recently we heard that story of a, a drone that apparently turned on its operator when it tried to stop it carrying its out its mission, you know, because it's all about the programming. So we're living in a very dodgy dancing world, and, and the AI specialists are coming together and saying we really do need to think about regulation and how we manage it. But we are, we always live in danger. We always live in a form of danger. You know, we go out, we may be hijacked, we, we have sex, we maybe catch HIV, we, we go out and uh, get run over, or we do X, Y, and Z. So the world and life we live, um, the things we do are always have some inherent risk in them. And we learn to manage all those things, and we have to manage them consciously. But the point about that is that Consciousness requires awareness of a situation and of other people around you, and it requires a certain interdependence. You know, I have to rely on you, you have to rely on me. You know, to manage COVID, we have to manage on other nations doing the same as we're doing. To manage climate, we've got to manage what other nations see as well. And so those extremes there are always creating massive arguments and things. Now, with AI, of course, You've got the possibility of deep fakes and dialogue and conversations and stories that are completely manufactured around a particular point of view. How do we know the difference? How can we tell them? What are our brains trained to do? So we've obviously got to train AI to catch AI. So it's an AI arms race. So yes, it's, it's very challenging. But we've put ourselves here as human. This is part of human progress. It could destroy us or it could make us fantastic. I lived, I was brought up in the, in the, in the um you know under the iron curtain and the cold war we had nuclear drills when i was growing up to dive under our desk my brother flew bombers if you like and he's a very peaceful guy and has moved on from that and uh, so he's but these are the situation we've always lived under so there's no there's nothing new about these risks what do we do though what do we do how does it mean how do we become ethical and ethicality comes always from a sense of what it does, not just the person in front of you, but for the whole system. And the system might be your company, because you might make an exception for somebody who you really like, who needs it. But then are you making an exception for everybody? Are you, Or do you have to hold the same rules to keep the system going for everybody? You might make an exception because it's somebody you know or like, or it's your family. That that's obviously unethical. Why is it unethical? Because somebody else who's got all the capability and possibility as a person you prefer is being denied that opportunity, whether it might be gender, it might be race, it might be opportunity, it might be something even more subtle on that because they are a Manchester United football supporter and you love Leeds or whatever it is, something trivial. You make these, you know what I mean? So ethicality is about policing yourself and and keeping yourself in this sort of, not not a, a warm, fuzzy place where you love everybody, although you should, of course, you know, be positive about people. But quite often it's making really tough decisions and to try and keep the system going for everybody and sometimes denying that one person's need, a special need, because it's going to damage a lot of others. So it's a very tough thing being ethical, and it, it, it has some deep rewards, I suppose, but it has an awful lot of tough, tough times where people will not particularly like you, especially the people you are attacking for being unethical. They're often monetized, they're often weaponized, and they're often now with AI hyper-weaponized in terms of what they say about you. So you, we need to think very carefully about the world we're coming into. And you need to know that being ethical is important for your identity and for the value you give to yourself at the end of the day. Very profound. Something that's always fascinated about um, fascinated me about your leadership is that you like to raise activists. Um, 
transformational leaders that activists. Oh, sorry, I'm going to say that again. <laughs> transformational <laughs> leaders who are activists. Yeah. What does that actually mean? Well, let's say climate. Let's say climate change. Shall we say climate breakdown is real, and I think most people would now come to accept that. Actually, it is. And if you don't accept it, then you've been caught in some cult of misinformation or it's so dreadfully fearful for you that you actually can't engage with it. And that's a pity. And then with AI, you can reinforce that. But let's say it is real for a moment. We can do two things. We want to sustain our businesses. So why don't we adapt to climate change? Let's all adapt to climate change. Oh, it's getting warmer. Let's change our businesses. Let's, let's, like we're adapting to electricity, like we're bald frogs. Now we don't worry about the electricity generation. We're just going solar. And let's say we adapt and we build our businesses. We move our houses up from the shoreline. We all emigrate to places where the climate is manageable. We create, raise crops that can deal with less water and more heat, you know, and those places, those that are desertified and we build urban infrastructures and cope with massive influx of people that will normally happen. And we beef up the police, etc., so we can control them, etc. So let's say we adapt so our businesses can go in. Now, that's one way forward, isn't it? But the missing part about the adaptation is, you know, this is the argument between mitigating climate change, which is fighting against it, or adapting to it, which is like, well, how can we stay profitable when this is coming? I believe you've got to mitigate. You've got to, you've got to attack the source. You know, inequality, gender inequality, is a massive, massive, massive damage to society and our potential, for example. Same as racial inequality. All those things which I would love to say, there's none of that in me, but I was brought up in a world where those things, and I'm sure many of those things were conditioned into me, and I have to become very, very aware of who I am and what's going on so I can overcome those things, see and overcome those things. Now, I don't think you should just adapt. I think you should fight against this thing that is destroying you know, our nature, uh, taking the opportunity for our kids to enjoy beautiful beaches, beautiful oceans, multiple types of wildlife, wonderful game, great communities where you can w integrate with a, a world that somehow is working. That's right. Understanding of the soil and its complexities and how to grow things that, that nourish soil and just strip it and shred it until it blows away. We have to fight some things. So should business people do that or is business just about making profit? No, business isn't about making profit only. That will assuredly take us to doom. Business is about maintaining our quality of life and providing value. If you equate value with profit, then you're deeply, deeply in need of some really self-reflection and, and things and, and uh, you know, counseling. So we actually have to fight. So business schools should be seeing the future coming and saying, this is not a future that I think is, not, is honorable or dignified. Businesses need to be not just about profit, but about creating value that lifts society collectively. That's what businesses always do. They create a value, not just profit. Profit is just how one measure of that value. And uh, it's an important measure, but sheer money and sheer profit are never going to make us all happy. We have to spread that money around. Otherwise, we're going to fight migration. We're going to fight poverty, whatever. So if you are a leader now, you have to have a consciousness that understands your, your limits of what you're counting is not just your profit, but you've caused damage in society. You've caused damage to nature. You've excluded people from opportunity. You need to pay for that. Otherwise, somebody else has to pay for it. You made that happen, so why don't we include those costs in you? And that's all about the triple bottom line. You know, I've damaged it. I've made that. I've created pollution. I should pay for that thing. Government shouldn't have to. People shouldn't have to. I should. And then your business models have to be much more astute, much cleverer, much more aware, much more conscious in order to make a business that doesn't just perpetuate that damage. And so around the world, we collectively have to come to think like that. And so your work in trying to promote conscious business, etc., is incredibly important, Carmen. It really is, because people need to think about these things. And, and it often seems impossible to do that. Well, it's not impossible. It's hard, but it's not impossible. You know, you have to make a choice. I really don't want to my kids to grow into a world that's depleted like that. And I'm willing to fight for it. I think businesses should. I think business schools should. And if you're serving businesses who are just paying your current 
commissions and fees to do a bit of work for them, but their business model is damaging society. If you don't point that out, you're not helping the business because it might for a while succeed, but in the end, it's going to reach a, a point where public opinion, damage, transparency on their decisions will hit them. Like it hit KPMG, Bain, and all those other companies in the, in the years of state capture who thought they were making a rational decision, but weren't. You know, they weren't. It, and it destroyed those companies. So we have to point out that companies need to be activists and social business schools. And by activism, I mean you have to mitigate, prevent the damage, not just adapt to it. It's so true um, what you're just mentioning there. I think um, this is one thing that's really become so real for me is I, I really, when I work with organizations, I choose to work with them. And I know it sounds very arrogant, but it's not coming from a place of arrogance. Mm -hmm. I need to have a clear conscience that whoever I'm working with is prepared to listen, but also at the same time is doing the right thing, even if they're not, that they're willing to listen and engage the conversations um, where I would put in the effort and the energy to bring data to the table, to bring the information, to say this is what we're dealing with, this is what's happening in society at large, and all the various tools that I've learned from, from Henley Business School, for example, systems thinking, external operating environment, the shared value models, looking at, at um, you know all of the various trends, but also understanding where innovation needs to happen. I was watching, a, um, I interviewed Faith the other day, um, and there was something in Japan where they had a, a, a school um, talk board with a scanner that went over it that's a computer. So every time the teacher writes on the, on the blackboard, there's this machine that goes over it and it scans, it computerizes all this information and then um, puts it into text and sends the notes to the children. And... I was like, are we innovating around the right problems in the classroom? I would say, I would think that the educational system in the schools needs to change um, rather than the school board. But anyway, that's just my opinion. <laughs> um, but I... <clears throat> I mean, it's, 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 it's looking at um, all of these various things of what needs to change in society. Something I want to quote um, that you're probably very familiar with is um, the economist Milton Friedman. And he used to say, a society that puts equality before freedom will get neither. A society that puts freedom before equality will get a, a high degree of both. And I don't know, I feel that's very conflicting because I think that's exactly why we're sitting in, in a mess that we are sitting with in society is because so many people were left behind. And inequality is just shaping into different forms and shapes. Like now it's the digital divide and I've always been very passionate. You know that, John. It's like, okay, now this tech revolution is happening, but what about the many people that don't are never going to have access to to technology in the first place, how are they going to adapt into this rapidly changing world when they are being left behind? It's a different type of colonialism. Well, I think you're right. I mean, you talk about system thinking. Let me deconstruct system thinking for a moment. You know, I have a headache, okay? And so uh, I get up in the morning, I take an aspirin. Ah, my headache goes away, okay? And then I, and I have other symptoms, lots of them. And then the next morning I get up again and I've got a headache and I take an aspirin and it goes away. I keep doing that. And every day I suddenly realize that I'm making these headaches and other, I'm getting unfit every day. You know, it's awful. And I keep on taking aspirins. Has the aspirin cured the problem? It's cured the symptom. So I've got rid of that. But what's curing a problem? Oh, maybe I'm a drinker. Or maybe I'm lounging in front of TV or staring at my screen for so long. And I see a pattern. When I drink more or I stare at my screen more or I don't exercise, then I start to see. There's my <laughs> symptoms. There, there are some of the patterns that are making this. I should look at those patterns. Okay, and if, maybe if I didn't drink so much or whatever else I'm doing, or not exercise, I wouldn't get a headache. So then I think, well, I must, I must not drink as much and I must take more exercise. But underneath that is the reason I was drinking. Uh, you know, I'm really upset. I've just got divorced and I'm, I'm not sure of myself. I've had bad teachers or I've got all these dilemmas or gosh, you know, got a sore leg and I, I could do Pilates instead of running or whatever. And so underneath that is who I am, the mindset. Now, system thinking, what we normally do, we, we cure all these million and one symptoms. And then we say, oh, well, I must get fit, and then I get fit. But why is it that you, some people are more inclined to get fit, or more inclined to drink than others? And that's quite deep, and that's why there's consciousness. So system thinking stops you working on all the symptoms, 
and that makes you understand the deep patterns and a few high, highly important and, and ambiguous leverage, highly leveraged things you must do. These are hard to identify, hard to work on, but this is how we built Henley. We used this model. We were very clear. We worked out what the deeper drivers were, a positivity about Africa, pushing purpose and identity beyond, beyond profit always, creating value for people, attracting the people who can create value. Ultimately, people would talk about us and would give us business, whatever. That's how we build a business. You very consciously got to manage those drivers. So when you talk about system thinking as a, as a way of understanding all these things, it opens up a whole new dimension of your thinking. It becomes a pattern of mind. And it's those patterns of mind that allow you to solve these really big problems and set you up for a better future. You know, I believe that perfectionism is a pathology. You know, if you know, it's like this thing, none of us can be perfect, you know, and uh, I don't know anyone who's perfect. I mean, of course, my children and my wife, you know, of course. But, you know, in the, rea in the, rea in the reality of things, you know, that then nothing's, nothing's perfect. So us trying to be perfect is, a, is, a, is an illusion. You know, we all have things to work on. Let's work, let's move ahead. There was, uh, I think it was Ralph Waldo Emerson once said a famous quote of mine, there's a foolish consistency is the hobgoblin of little minds um, adored by statesmen and philosophers and divines. So this idea that everything must be consistent and harmonized, it's nuts. Nothing is. I'm not, you're not. My emotions aren't always like that. My brain isn't like that. It comes and goes. In fact, our brains fire in very complicated ways. We use very trivial ways to understand intelligence, you know, left brain, right brain. That doesn't exist. It, it really doesn't exist. It's not a true thing. It's, our brains are far more complicated. IQ as a, as, a, as a measure of intelligence. Well, intelligence is incredibly complex, multiple thing. Even those different types of intelligences don't capture it. You know, our intelligence is something we hardly understand. And so even when we talk about artificial intelligence, we're, we're seeing its capability to do a few things. And you talk about its sentience, that's another thing. But what we're looking at there is, is creating a, a computational methodology that's able to work so fast in so many of the domains that are non-mathematical. You know, they are mathematical. They produce words that are plausible rather than we've written. They let, allow us to... Um, just the thing about AI, you could, you could say AI is fundamentally the wisdom of the crowd, which is not very wise yet. And we all know the wisdom yes. of the crowd can be right, but it's not always very inspired. It certainly isn't inspired. So all this will involve. So what we need to do as we measure ourselves and we measure our businesses is understand that in order to be sustaining, we need to work on these deep drivers. Why has our world been damaged like this? Why do we have corruption? You know, corruption, very likely, because of lack of opportunity. Why do we have this divide in South Africa? You know? It's not because people are more intelligent than others. It's because they have more opportunities. We're all gifted with more or less the same intelligence in life, whatever we are, whatever we look like. We're probably mostly pretty much the same. Education doesn't make you more intelligent per se. It allows you to drive your motor, your engine, in better and different ways. It allows you to accelerate the use of this brilliant mind we have and, and whatever. So people who are stuck in poverty have not had opportunity, as simple as that. It's not about necessarily even giving them X, Y, and Z. It's about giving people decent education and not the sort of education that reads what some teacher who is on some sort of trip of, you know, perfect academia or exam passing mode. So you can just present that and program that into the kids better because their writing is so awful. But something that's inspired. You know, we say education isn't about filling people. It's about lighting fires under them so they fly. You know, it's, it's letting people grow. And so the people we are excluding through a lack of opportunity are the people who are keeping us in poverty. Why? Not because because they they we we're keeping them there actually fundamentally. They're keeping us in poverty. Why? Because they are have the capability to be rich, and we aren't producing that option for them, rich in their lives, or whatever. We need to educate, produce opportunities, believe in people. And, and then these people will create what they naturally are endowed to do and should have the right to do, which is to create better lives for themselves and for society. And, and there's millions of them who are excluded. And there's this 
massive arrogance that educated people sometimes have, which is just like colonialism or racism, is that I'm better than you because of. I'm mm -hmm. better than you because mm -hmm. I'm a Asian a woman, a man, this, that, you know, whatever. I'm educated, I'm English, I'm clear, whatever it is, black, white. All this thing, you're devaluing somebody else. And we often devalue people who don't have because we kind of think, well, you know, there's this, maybe maybe they're just not educated, maybe they're not so smart. Well, that's absolute rubbish. And I think this form of pernicious judgment on people who haven't got is just pervasive around the world. We've got to attack that. If we invest in people, and we invest in people who are poor in South Africa, and we do it in the right way, South Africa will zoom up. Corruption will diminish because nobody's going to allow me to give something to my friend or my kid um, who is not actually particularly capable when I've spent 15 years learning a whole bunch of skills and capabilities to become a really good architect and I want to give it, I want to, give it to my draftsman kid to do the, do the job who's not as well educated as me because I know them. I'm going to fight that. I'm going to make it transparent. So we have a really delicate future ahead of us and what we need to do is just believe that we can make a difference. Um, and I don't, and I'm afraid not a heroic difference either, just the sort of difference that's just, just keep walking in the right direction and just encourage other people to do that as well. You know, we, we have a cult of the superhero, which I think is dangerous because it diminishes the contribution and recognition of people like me or, and, and, and I'm, you know, you, whatever, ordinary people in the best possible way, I would hope, ordinary people who, who are trying their best, in spite of their frailties, to to do something worthwhile, you know. Um, and it always feels like you're never doing enough and never doing it well, I have to say. You know, for me anyway, it's never, oh gosh, I've only had done that. I've only, oh God, what a mistake. Oh, why did I, did I really do that? You know, um, but you have to pick yourself up and keep going. You know, and we've got to, you've got to let, you've got to give people a break, you know. Sometimes we don't give other people a break, and that's okay. Well, I, I messed that up, but you can't stop living and trying because of that. You just got to try and feed it back forward uh, and lift it up again. Sorry, a bit of homespun philosophy. I'm so sorry. Yeah. No, this is very insightful, yeah. and and you you touch on yeah. something very interesting that I I'm willing to share because uh, I have you in the room. <laughs> is um, when you spoke about perfectionism, I've learned something very powerful um, about that about myself is I used to be the super perfectionist trying to perfect everything. And what I've learned about it is, is if you ha ha have so much control over, thing over everything in your life, you actually have no control. And it's actually in those moments that you don't have control, those messy moments where big ideas happen. So I'm, I'm actually engaging um, lack of perfectionism, if I can put it that way, in my life because it actually allows for bigger aha moments and creativity to flow. I know it sounds crazy, but I mean, it's, it's really a profound thing. And um, I want to, to add on to that. So um, uh, one of the, uh, my colleagues, the lady that um, helps to keep, maintain our home, um, I decided, she, I, I said to her, what, are, what is your dream? What do you want to achieve in your life? And she says, I... I want to build a legacy. And I said, how do you think you're going to build your legacy? And, and she says to me, she wants to buy a piece of land. I said, okay, now when you have the piece of land, what do you, what do you want to do? Um, and she says, I want to grow vegetables and I want to sell it in the community. And I was like, okay, that's great. How can we make that happen? It's an easy thing for me to make, hap make it happen. So I spoke to our gardener um, and I said to him, why don't you come an extra week, uh, extra day, um, twice a month and then you teach her how to grow a garden and teach her all your skills I'll teach her what I know and then we all learn together and then I don't know how to garden and then we are learning from each other and this way we can take leadership into becoming self-sustainable at home and then whatever we grow we enjoy a meal together or we can make food together so it eventually now progressed to to the stage where we not take food from the from the garden and put it onto the table so now we have learned together how to create healthy exciting meals and now it's like growing into this little exciting thing that's happening in the household now that 
gives hope and that gives admiration to to those um, people that are willing to work ex extra hour in the garden so that they can learn the skill and um, enjoy the fruits of their hard labor, but also being to learn, you know, learning from each other, mentoring yeah, each other. Yes, totally. I'm not a title. You're not a title. You know, let's just take everything away and strip the, everything away and know that we are humanity and let's learn from each other because we all know something the other one doesn't. Yeah, we all need these psychological props for the to fight off the endless void of the existential angst and apocalyptic whatever that we all fear that probably exists. But, you know, that's not what life is, is it? We live here. Now, you talked about why if you'd been perfectionist, you couldn't have taught that because you wouldn't have known the whole thing. So how could I teach somebody? Or you would have found something about it and they would have to do it right for some. You co-learned, didn't you? You dived into something and you learned, but you didn't even know what you were going to learn, right? So if you have perfectionists, you try and define what you're going to learn and do because of your mindset of this moment. But your mind is going to change the moment you have new experiences and try something new. It'll, it'll be different. And you can't forecast what that's got to be. But you've got to trust that, generally speaking, when people learn and try to do things, they get value out of it. And, and you told that story with such kind of passion and, and love in your eyes about that thing that you obviously got a lot out of it. If you'd been perfectionist, you couldn't, you would have tried, to, you would try to dominate the whole thing, but you allowed yourself to enter into something where human dynamics and the world and all our curiosities work together to try and, try and fix things. Because the one hugely important thing about people is we're amazing, amazing, amazing practical problem solving people in real time. You know, there's there's this um, there's a story you've probably heard about these, these soldiers who joined a, another army, and uh, they they joined the army and did this exercise in the mountains in winter, and they lost their map, and it was a different set of mountains they'd never been into. Let's say it was NATO, and it was the Pyrenees instead of the Alps they were used to, and they were from northern Italy or somewhere. Anyway, they they huddled down, there, and one of the soldiers in the back of the rucksack found this crumpled concertina little map that had fallen into a crevice and pulled out and said, I have a map, I have a map. And they all huddled around and said, oh, we're saved because we're getting frostbite. And they looked at the map and they navigated down a mountain. They found a stream, they found a road. And then the, the army found them and the officers found them. They took them to the field hospital and said, oh, thank you, sir, you saved me. And let's say it was a British colonel. They said, oh, well done, chaps. What happened? So we found a map. And so the colonel looked at the map and said, but this map is of the Alps, not of the Pyrenees. <laughs> and the fact is that quite often we've got to create, we create a, an idea that lets us get going and then we, we adapt and our unconsciously make sense of what's going on. We're brilliant improvisers, learning machines in real time. We're co-learners. We learn in community. And so one of the problems about perfectionism is, is, is it's this massive arrogance that the tiny little thing you know with that great depth, which might be in the, in the land of the blind, the one-eyed person is king, might be more than all the others there, but you have this illusion that your tiny narrow bit of knowledge, which is just above here, gives you some. The fact is, your tiny little bit of knowledge is that big, and you, we've just talked about AI being billions of times more intelligent than us. How can I be perfectionist about knowledge when you already have said that AI is going to be a billion times more intelligent whatever that is. So you can't, we fear actually this, this growth and learning. You know, the people who rode horses must be terrified of the thought that you get into something in the morning and you jump into something that's got 250 horses. I've, I'm driving 250 horses, it's going to kill me. In fact, they used to have flags in front of the cars to slow them down, to warn people, and you couldn't go over 30 miles an hour because you couldn't breathe, is what people thought. Now, you jump in a car where it might be 150 horse car, or maybe you've got a 500 horsepower thing that you drive, but you're jumping into 500 horses, it must kill you, mustn't it? The fact is, we use technology. You find out ways to use it. Now, this AI is a very potentially dangerous technology. It's hugely dangerous. Mm. And all the, all the extremely skilled people who know about that uh, are not being stupid when they're saying we have to start to regulate it and all that. Um, yeah. But nobody knows. You see, nobody knows. On the other hand, equally, it can solve millions of, of really good day-to-day -day problems for us. It can make us richer if you want, or it could help solve some of the issues of this incredibly complex interaction that our pollution of the atmosphere and our pollution of the Earth creates. 
that we don't understand well enough to solve yet. It's only more mythical ideas like, you know, James Lovelock's Gaia hypothesis, which posits the idea of the Earth being an intelligent being and being a system itself, that, that are, actually are very useful because they, they create this idea that the Earth itself is a living organism, um, not these bits and pieces here. Now, it may or may not be true that it's a conscious living organism. It kind of doesn't matter. What it does is force you to think about the millions of complex interactions. If you want to read a book, you want to read Regenesis by George Monbiot. Uh, M-O-N-B-I-O-T, his first couple of chapters where he describes what earth and soil are, um, are absolutely mind-numbing because the complexity and the kilometers of micro-life in just a handful of soil and the depth of multiple different sorts of bacteria, we think soil is about nutrients, humus, and fertilizers. It's not. It's a living, massive symbiosis of multiple types of bacteria, of tiny living nerve, of fungi. All this is a rich thing that makes plants absorb nutrients, grow, be healthy, be resilient, and supports all the complex things which we don't even begin to understand. Mm. You know, we don't even begin to understand. So we're at the nexus now, the point where we could absolutely destroy ourselves. But we've got there, and it's up to us not to let this happen. And your idea of conscious consciousness and conscious leadership becomes really important for that. It forces you to trust your own imperfections in the, in this, in the search of something that is worthwhile. You can't, you can't be perfect, so accept it and just kind of enjoy the ride and try and do some good, man. You know, yeah. hippie, hippie talk, you know. Hippie talk. <laughs> but it's, yeah. but it's, 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 listen, I, 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 I'm like, as I'm getting older, I'm like, Jesse, this is fascinating. Um, I think the this, this shift happened for me when I was in my 40s, and I'm actually um, researching that quite significantly. It's like that 40 shift. It's like when you really start thinking about life. Um, but I now have a worm farm. Never oh, thought I would great. put my hand on soil. <laughs> um, I'm making my own compost. And um, I'm, I mean, I'm learning from everybody over here that's teaching me these things. And then I started feeding birds. And the birds come and wake me up every morning at half past five to tell me to go to the other side to feed them. And I would sit and eat my breakfast and watch them and the hierarchy of how their ecosystems and how the wildlife respects each other, how they take turns that everybody can actually eat. Yes, they will chase each other away, whatever. But the, the, the fact is there's no greed. Everybody gives each other an opportunity to get a seed, to go and feed their family, if you, if, if you may. And sometimes when you, when you look at that, you recognize that we are one with, um, with nature. And if we can understand the interconnectedness of how we are with nature, we have so much more respect for each other and recognize that everybody's on their own journey. As long as um, that inward journey happens. I think um, the, the inward journey is where you truly find yourself. And if you can just focus on yourself as a being, that is where you can make a difference. It's just changing who you are and be at one and at peace with who you are as a person. Because, you know, the people that, that hurt you the most are the people that are cut themselves and that are hurting, they hurt people the most. And if we can all just work on ourselves, um, all of this crazy cray cray that goes on online can maybe hold down for a bit um, and especially with an um, AI technology I mean like um, I, I, I look at these things and I go wow you know there was good intent with everything and then you just put the human race on it and everybody that's uh, that's woke but not aware and and um, feed this machine data and then what what's going to be the outcome yeah, I, I think it's right. You know, we have a tool, which is an educated mind that articulates all sorts of words, what the meditators would call the mind, you know, this this rampant thing that's completely uncontrollable. And if you talk to people who've done a lot of meditation in their lives, I mean, I was listening to Jack Cornfield the other day talking about Ram Dass, who died not so long ago, a very oh, famous yeah. meditation guy. And... Um, and Jack Cornfield, who's also one of those Zen guys, saying to him, oh, Ramdas, you know, I'm, uh, how do you control your feelings and your thoughts and these passions and your fears? He said, I mean, it's so great. You're so peaceful. You're obviously, that's so good that you've got rid of them and you've overcome them. 
said, oh, no, 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 no. They're still there. They're still exactly the same. They never go away. I just don't care about them so much, you know. And so the point is we try, the mind identifies these things that we do and tries to specify what life is. It then tries to tell us how to cure that. But it's like it's trying to cure itself with the same tools. It's like you can't. You've actually got to let it go and and be a little bit more. And and in that being, as far as I understand, when it happens, which is rare because I'm just as compulsive and caught up as anybody is most times. I try, you know, but I admire people and I get a lot out of people who are trying to do that. So we're mutual in doing this. In those other times, I start to see, oh, well, okay, I can't express what it is not to be thinking all the time. But what I do know it feels better and I look at my fears and and I go into them a little bit more and in doing that I feel uh, somehow a bit fuller and, and at the same time I start to feel a bit more caring you know for people around me and and also probably for myself as well but I'm not art I'm not artificially making that it just kind of is it's almost as that that is part of our real identity and um, and I think we have develop these sophisticated minds that trap us into trying to cure and think everything too much. They're, they're, they're only mm. tools as well. So I think it's really important to try and understand that the consciousness doesn't mean like you suddenly got all the answers. It's, it's, mm -hmm. it's like you can have a purpose and a meaning and believe. And the other thing is that even there, you're going you're gonna to meet people sometimes who are in their journey and you're going to clash and cross because there's always a lot going on in all of us. You don't mean to, nobody means to hurt each other, really, or sometimes we do, I suppose. But you often have to make a decision for one that will be very hard for them so that the collective can do well. You, know, you might have somebody who's built up a whole business making plastic things and their whole family is educated, their whole community is supported by it. And this fantastic wealth that's created in the community support is, is, is made these fantastic plastic artifacts and creates lots of smoke and you, you've got to put it on the, on the soil and the microplastics go in the water from it. And in stopping that person doing that, you're actually, you're actually really creating a damage for that whole subsystem. And, and on a bigger scale, that's like the oil lobby. You know, and so you're always going to fight. So if you are going to be conscious, as, as Jung said, there's no consciousness without conflict, either inner and very often outer. And yeah. you, don't yeah. have to, you don't have to hate it. You may, and the other thing, if you're going to be activist, you have to know that you will probably lose. But the point is, if you if you know that you know those ants, those Zulu ants that go across the rivers, the streams, and they go and they hold on to each other, and then the ones in front drown, but they're still having the ones go on top, and they, and they make this bridge, and they they on a whole body of dead ants underneath them who are locked in with each other just before they died. You know that's how activists are. You do your bit and go as far as you can, knowing you're doing something for your kids or for your, your friends in the future or for generations down, seven generations as the, as the Native Americans, would, the First Nation would call it. Um, you might not make it, but you're making a bridge for people to follow you. Without you doing your bit, the other people behind you wouldn't do it. So you, you cannot think it's just you. you. You're part of a movement. And this idea you're part of a movement is, is incredibly important. This solo operation that we're conditioned to do in a lot of our education um, we're all part of movements, and we have to create benign movements. Even then, we might make a mistake. Is it a cult? Have you lost a job? Have you become a Nazi party, or have you whatever? So it's always on the edge. You've got to be sensing and awake, and asking and testing yourself, and hoping beyond hope that the care you have is going to be something useful in life, if you can keep it there. Another bit of homespun so philosophy, I'm sorry. Going on a lot today. No, it's so beautiful and it's so true. And one thing I have to say is that it's um, one thing I have learned about activism at Henley and especially from you, John, is it ha it come, you can't just be an anarchist. You can't just go there and create chaos. Okay. It has to be a value system in place. Um, and with with values um, and, and with a movement, you know, you, you need to make sure there's not a void. And there needs to be substance in whatever you're trying to achieve and, you know, slow progression, but also 
um, you first start with yourself and you are going to make mistakes and maybe somebody behind you is going to pick you up when you make a mistake and, and point out where you are going wrong. And it's having that willingness also to accept criticism from those around you. That to me is, is a, is, is a perfect leader. And it's sometimes, um, you know, having that conversation where we all lead together because we are rooted in the same yeah. value and the same morals. You kind of got to care about something, haven't you? Whether it's you, yeah. your partner, the people you love, the family, and you don't want to care, care about a little cult or club that's fighting the whole world, because we are programmed to be very tribal. I mean, that, that guy, George Monbiot, who is a very famous environmental activist, I saw him writing in the newspaper, The Guardian, the other day. Oh, I'm so sorry. But a few years ago, he was raving on about the fantastic, you know, wood stoves, how brilliant they are, how energy saving they are, how, you know, the wood isn't it, really creates these says. I oh, know, but I've just found out that the wood smoke pollution is far worse than any other pollution. So for years, he was trying to activate about that, but now he's realized, oh, no, I was all wrong. And that's another state that we all get all the time. We are constantly always wrong. And um, we, we, we are doing our best. We might be quite right, and we might be right about a lot of things, but you can be sure that in your rightness, you will be many, many, many things that we, a, we don't understand or we're just basically wrong. In the universe of knowledge of the incredible number of trillions and trillions of galaxies there are and the trillions of, I don't know what the words are, of, of solar systems in all those galaxies, you know, we are just, we have so little knowledge. So let's kind of have a sense of humor and enjoy the ride while we're trying to do some good. Learn everything you can, but don't think your knowledge defines you as something better. You just had a bit more time and you studied. If you feel you are doing something useful and other people, and you can see other people's lives going, and if in here it's not an ego what I'm proud of this person, if it just feels like it's okay, you know, this feels right to me, this feels like it's kind of healthy and this, we're probably on the right track here, then you're probably doing okay and try and bundle up with a few other people who are doing the same thing. But then when, when we have a crisis point like we're facing now, you can't sit and wait for the dynamics. You, you know, there's, there's a question, how, how activist do you get? So when you see the extension, uh, Extinction Rebellion people or, or the, you know, those oil people in the UK who are blocking up roads and whatever, I, I was in a traffic jam caused by them the other day. You feel very cross, what's going on? And you say, oh God, these are the people I'm trying to support and they're there, you know, and they're disrupting my life for now. How difficult is it? But so you've actually got to have a point where at some point you've got to say, you've got to make choices. I mean, the, the climate activist thing is, I'm on a ship, and it's sailing It's sailing towards the rocks. The captain and crew are all there. I've told the captain and crew it's sailing towards the rocks and it's going to crash. Uh, I can see it. The whole crew can see it. We all know it's going to... Am I, am I breaking a law if I take command of that ship and steer it off the rocks to save everybody's lives? And they use that allegory as a sort of legal equivalent for why we should actually do something about the climate, or whatever it is that's damaging. It could be AI now that's going potentially going to damage all of us. So how do we do it? Um, the question, these are massively complex issues, and that's why um, we need to create movements, but also we need to create, ultimately, global coordinations, global controls that, that people adapt to. Uh, whether we can ever do that properly, I don't know. Um, but not knowing doesn't mean you shouldn't try. <laughs> when you have a when you have a love affair, when you meet a relationship, do you know that's going to last forever? Do you, you know you don't know anything really? You assume it. Things don't work out, but you still got to try. You know, and um, so I think that's a, that's the state of activism we're in. So you talk about conscious leadership and ethical leadership. You know, you can read a book on ethics. But really, how do we get to how do we get to think what ethics is? And it isn't, and it doesn't put you on a pedestal being ethical, uh, trying to be ethical. It, it doesn't because a, what is ethics? The greater number, the greater good, and you know all sorts of different models what ethics are. But you need to do something that fundamentally may hurt you for the greater good, uh, in a sense. That's part of being ethical, and to stand up for something that where you might get a lot of pushback. Um, for for a good of people you care about, or if you care more than just your family or you, for the people around you, and if you can think yourself as part of humanity in a 
understanding all the vagaries of humanity and not being put off by it and not selectively choosing a little cult of group, if you can start to feel more of the human condition and that's in you and that's who you are, so you're quite understanding of people and appreciate people and the life we live in, then you, then you should be activist. You should do something about it. Um, mm. And act, just destroying activism is about building. It's about building something that has become decayed and out of date and is fundamentally damaging that nobody can escape from the businesses, you know, the, the positions, the jobs, you know, our status, our, who we are, the identity of ourselves as Southern Christians or Muslims or Democrat or Republican or this or that, you know, these crazy wars that are going on. Am I willing to move beyond that to think of, think of something that I think may be more important than whether I'm left wing or right wing or whatever? And activism means trying to go along with that, not trying to be a guru, not trying to be anything else, just trying to do your level best to get things going in the right direction so that we'll all be a little bit better moving forward instead of destroying the beautiful country we have, beautiful world we have. You know, I mean, you talk about your birds. I totally get that. You know, there's something in that that, you, that, that seems too... The words seem too trivial to express that feeling of being close to nature and watching how they work. It's something that is close to our historical nature, you know, us and the animals. Okay, so which is the animal? And uh, we all are, obviously, you know, sorry. <laughs> sorry. <We all. laughs> we don't believe that. We are somehow superior, you know. We are superior in some ways, but surely not intrinsically. Yeah. John, it's, it, it's been such a profound conversation. I really enjoyed it. I felt like I sat with you on, on next to a fireside. Um, I want to close off with something um, that you touched on. Um, I, I recently started watching, I'm, I'm fast, I, just for your, I am a bit of an esoteric, so I started, started studying numerology as well to understand the human design through numbers. Um, and there's a story behind it, why I did it. But anyway, um, so I started um, watching like things like the, um, Leonardo da Vinci um, decoded and um, Shakespeare decoded, etc. And something that's really interesting from Nostradamus, all of them, they spoke in this secret language. It's just like Shakespeare is a play within a play within a play. There's actually a hidden code. Um, and all of them had the same behavior because they were activists in, in their time. But what happened was they knew that if they if they that people would figure it out centuries later so they coded their work and for people to discover at a later stage and then when you start looking at the decoding it's fascinating and how we interpret everything and where it's actually accepted um, in the modern time that we live in and how they managed to preserve it for 400 years by the way that they coded it and um that made me realize that sometimes maybe the work that we are doing now might not be understood by those around us, but will be understood by generations ahead of us that we will never get to meet. So that's well, why I believe it's important. Mm -hmm. Well, that's very interesting because, you know, if, if I were to read that, I'd probably come to a different conclusion about the code from you or others maybe. And so I can't say, but if I were to say, is there a code in things? I think in a way there is, there's a very natural code of being human um, that you will see written by good people in good books, I mean, or whatever it is. And, um, and it's basically about us trying to achieve what, what, what we mean by being human over, over our lives and um, lives which must end, you know, and, and so what are we going to do? And I think that the code for me is that, you know, there's this relationship, there's emotion, there's eternal battle within ourselves between grabbing this or not doing that. It's just an endless flow. And I'm going back to that Ram Dass thing, you know, at the end, can it, be, can it not quite matter so much for you? So you can just be there and enjoy being with people. Um, and maybe... In, you know, we have to get incredibly sophisticated and complex about many things, coding, safety, airplanes, electricity, you know, the world we live in, the, the electricity grid around the world, the complex structures of multiple systems in cities or in our companies or in ourselves or in, the, in earth or in soil. These are the, the amount of detail and complexity and knowledge that's locked up now we've only just touched is, is massive. We can't possibly know all that, but we can understand bits of it and use it. 
the code to me is that beyond all that, so what? How can I be on, on top of that? How can I be something that's I can feel is maybe being slightly worthwhile, and maybe I can, maybe people can help me, and I'll be open for that. Maybe I can also help others a little bit. And maybe in that flow, life gets a bit more worthwhile. Maybe I can play some music and appreciate some music. Maybe I can appreciate, appreciate, appreciate. And that appreciation often, I think, gives value to everything. So I don't know any answers, but I do know that I do know some of the things that aren't answers. Anyway, John, thank you so much for your time. And um, thank you, Carmen. may we all find a way to inspire um, conscious leaders in, in every action and everything that we do and learn from those mistakes where we don't manage to do that. Yeah, so seize much. the opportunity. Seize the opportunity to learn. Don't be excluded from learning. Don't let anyone do that from you. Fight that. Exactly. You, you, have, a <laughs> yes. right to, you have a right to grow this. Grow it. And you will find that what you're just as capable as anyone. What we have is pretty much the same around the world. Even if you don't believe it, just do it, and you will start. You will start to see it. Just continue to fight to develop yourself and to to learn, to learn, to learn. Don't ever get excluded from that. Whatever, it's criminal act. You know, the destruction <laughs> of our education is a criminal act. Okay. One hundred percent. So wise words. Thank you so much, John. Have a wonderful Thank you, Carmen. Good luck. Bye.